So I'd like to begin first by giving the board members an opportunity to introduce themselves to you, beginning on my right with Member Brooks. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Doug Brooks, and I'm going to talk, talk about the position. Just welcome. Okay. Okay. Brooks, thank you. Hi, I'm Patrick Keogh. Thanks for coming out tonight. Hi, Patty McCoy. Thank you so much for being here. It's a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. Good evening, this is Anupam Chuk Sidhu. Thanks for all of you that are here and for those watching. Good evening, Sean Wilson. All right, I'd like to begin, well, I'd like to introduce the members of my core team, uh, beginning with my assistant, Ms. Diane Robertson, and we thank her for taking the minutes to each of our regular meetings, and our special meetings, and all of our committee meetings as well. We appreciate Diane. Like the remaining members of the core team to introduce themselves to you, beginning with Mr. Brandon. Good evening, Nick Brandon, Executive Director of Communications and Marketing, welcome. Good evening, Kurt Siskowitz, Executive Director of Student Services. Hi, I'm Debbie Piaz. I'm the Chief Finance and Operations Officer. Welcome. Welcome, Liz Vartanian Gibbs, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources. Welcome, Beth Rail, Chief Academic Officer. Okay, at this time, I'd like to invite a motion for the adoption of the agenda for this organizational meeting. Is there a motion? Madam President, I'd like to move that we adopt the Superintendent <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent Merritt, I'd like to move that we adopt the agenda for the organizational meeting. Second. It has been moved and properly second that we adopt the agenda. Those in favor, signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed, say no. Motion carries. How many? Five. Six. Five. 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 Zero. The agenda for the organizational meeting will be adopted as presented. Now I eagerly would like to invite a motion for the nomination of the president of the Board of Education for the 2021-2022 school year. And as a reminder, there is not a need for a second when you have nominations for officers. So are there any nominations for the office of the president? I would like to nominate Patty McCoy for the presidency. Are there any other nominations for the office of the president? Hearing none, I will call for the vote. Those in favor of voting for Patty McCoy as the president of the Board of Education for the 2021-2022 school year signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed saying no. Motion carries, 5-0. Congratulations, President McCoy. <laughs> Please assume your duties. <laughs> Just can't wait. <laughs> All right, so then. This is close. Not very close. I am looking for a motion for vice vice president of the school board for the school year. Madam President, I move that we uh, make a new from trip to you, vice president for this next coming school year. All right. All in favor, say yes. Wait, you have to ask if anyone else wants. Oh, I'm point. sorry. Are there any other nominations? I know everybody was so eager. All right. All in favor, say yes. 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 Any opposed, say no. Okay. All right, congratulations, Anupam. All right, now I am looking for a motion for, I'm looking for a nomination for secretary of the school board for the 2021-2022 school year. Madam President, I nominate Doug Brooks to be secretary for uh, the next school year. Are there any other nominations? All right, hearing none, uh, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say yes. 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 Any opposed, say no. All right. Congratulations. Now I am looking for a nomination for a treasurer. Madam President, I uh, nominate for a treasurer uh, Patrick Kehoe. All right. Are there any other nominations? <laughs> I did warn Lauren. <laughs> 
You're not here. Good for you. <laughs> All right, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor say yes. 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 All right, six to zero. Well, she's here. Oh, Miranda's right. here. here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I keep looking for you over there. Yeah. All right. So now we are going to go through the um, board bylaws. So if everybody could get them, um, they were attached. They are attached to the agenda. Page four. Um, yeah. So it's page four, or you can click the link. If you have it up on your um, computer. So we are going to start with bylaws number uh, 0164.1 and 0164.2. Time, place, and notification of meetings. I am looking for a motion. Madam President, I move that we approve bylaws number 164.1 and 164.2. Time, place, and notification of meetings. All right, I have one. Okay. It has been moved by member Sidu and seconded by member Kiho. Um, Anupam, can you read that for us, please? Sure. Regular meetings of the Board of Education of the Plymouth Canton Community Schools, Wayne and Washington Counties, Michigan, shall be held on the second and the fourth Tuesday of each month, except there will only be one meeting in July, July 13th, and one meeting in December, December 7th, beginning at 7 p.m. at the following location, except as agreed upon herein, unless otherwise directed by a majority vote of the members. The address is E.J. McClendon Educational Center, 454 South Harvey Street, Plymouth, Michigan, 48170. All right, thank you. Um, Sean, can you read the next one, 164.2, special meetings? Sure, special meetings of the Board of Education of the Plymouth Camp Community Schools, Wayne and Washtenaw Counties, Michigan, may be called by the president of the board or any two members thereof by serving on the other members a written notice of the day, time, and place of such special meetings or by a majority vote of the board. Public notice of each meeting of the Board of Education shall be given by posting a copy of the notice on the message board by the front entrance of the E.J. McClendon Educational Center, 454 South Harvey, Plymouth, Michigan, at least 18 hours prior to the time of the meeting the executive secretary of the Board of Education or other central office staff in her absence shall be appointed uh, the designee for posting notice of the meetings. All right, so um, all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed say no. All right. And then the next one is um, Oh, uh, motion uh, to direct the Secretary of the Board of Education to advertise bylaws numbers 164.1 and 164.2 in the Plymouth and Canton Observer newspapers. So I'm looking for a motion. Madam President, I move that we um, direct the Secretary of the Board of Education to advertise bylaws numbers 164.1 and 164.2 in the Plymouth Canton Observer newspapers. All right, I'm looking for a second. Second. All right. Uh, all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right. So now we are at five, which is authorized signatures for school district business. Um, so this, I need a motion for this. Madam President, I move that we authorize the signatures for school district business. And I need a second. Second. All right. Um, it's been moved by member Kehoe and was that Doug? Yes. Okay. And seconded by Member Brooks. Um, can you read that for us, Patrick, please? Sure. It was moved by Member uh, Kehoe and seconded by Member Brooks to authorize the following signatures for school district business. There's a list of documents here and authorized signatures. A. Administrator contracts by the President, Secretary, or Superintendent. B. Teacher contracts. 1. Probationary, President, Secretary, or Superintendent. B. 2 continuing tenure by President, Secretary, or Superintendent. C, motor vehicle titles by the Superintendent, Chief Finance and Operations Officer. D, land contracts by the President, Secretary, or Superintendent. E, deeds to real estate by the President, Secretary, or Superintendent. F, leases and easements by the President, Secretary, or Superintendent, or Chief Finance and Operations Officer. G, deposit and investment accounts by the President, Treasurer, Superintendent, Chief Finance and Operations Officer, Director of Finance and Accounting. H, 
vendor contracts by the superintendent, chief finance, and operations officer. All right. Uh, all in favor, say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right. So now we are on six, which is considering the following resolutions. Naming depository, investment of monies, and naming signatories for all funds. I am looking for a motion. Ma Madam President, I move that we name the depository investment of monies and naming signature for all signatories for all funds. Okay. I'm looking for a second. Second. All right, it was moved by Member Kehoe and seconded by Member Brooks. Um, Member Brooks, can you read that for us, please? Yes, uh, it was moved by Member Kehoe and seconded by Member Brooks at the Treasurer and or Chief Finance Officer, Officer um, to authorize it to deposit all monies for all funds of the Plymouth Canton Community Schools in the following banks. Bank of America, Comerica, Community Financial Credit Union, Fifth Third Bank, Flagstar Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, M.A., Michigan Liquid Assets Fund, Morgan Stanley, PNC Bank and PNC Capital Markets, LLC, and Public Trust Advisors, LLC. Uh, continue uh, and further to invest all monies of all funds of the Plymouth Canton Community Schools in investments authorized under Section 1223 of the Michigan School Code of 1976 as amended and further that these banks be requested, authorized, and directed to honor checks, drafts, and other orders for the payment of money drawn in the name of Plymouth Canton Community Schools against the name <coughs> funds when bearing facsimile signatures of treasurer, um, Kehoe and the facsimile signature of President McCoy, and further that the Huntington National Bank, Bank of New York, and UMB Bank NA be designated the paying agent for bond of the Plymouth Canton Community Schools as required, and further a bank a blanket position bond is required for all school district employees in the amount of $100,000 and the cost of the bond be provided by the school district. All right, um, all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed say no. All right, so now we are on to B. Um, and this is naming our general counsel. I don't see underneath it, um, I know there's, did we vote on this all at once, the general counsel and specific legal counsel? The general counsel is here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I need a motion for uh, naming our general counsel, which would be Collins and Blaha Law Firm. So I think to your point, Patty, yeah. there's no A's and A's yeah. section. So I think we probably should do them either. We can do them together. Okay. All right. So, um, looking for a motion to name our general counsel, which would be Collins and Blaha, and then naming other specific legal counsel as appointed by the Board of Education. We'll just put those two together. So, I'm looking for a motion. Madam President, I move that we name our general counsel and the naming of other specific legal counsel as appointed by the Board of Education. Thank you. I'm looking for a second. Second. All right. So, it was moved by Member Kehoe and seconded by Member Brooks to appoint legal counsel for 2021-2022, Collins and Blaha Law Firm PC General Counsel, and specific legal counsel is appointed by the Board of Education, Clark Hill PLC, Lacey and Jones LLP, LaPointe and Associates PC, Miller Canfield Paddock and Stone PLC, and through Law Firm PC. So, all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right. Now we are down to D, which is naming school district auditor. So um, I am looking for a motion. Madam President, I move that we appoint Plant Moran LLC certified public accountants as the school district auditors for 21-22 school year. Thank you, I'm looking for a second. Second. All right, it was moved by member Sidhu and seconded by member Wilson. 
to appoint Blant Moran LLC certified public accounting as the school district auditors for 2021-2022. Um, all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, so next is E, naming school district financial consultant. I am looking for a motion. Madam President, I move that we appoint Public Financial Management Incorporated as the school district's bond financial advisor for the year 2021-2022. Thank you, I'm looking for a second. Second. All right, it was moved by Member Brooks and seconded by Member Chastain to appoint Public Financial Management Incorporated as the school district's bond financial advisor for 2021-2022. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right, so we are down now to seven, which is designate routine advertisement. So I am looking for a motion to designate Plymouth and Canton Observer, Detroit Newspaper Agency, or the Michigan Chronicle for routine advertisements. Madam President, uh, I move that Plymouth, uh, I move that Plymouth and Canton Observer, the Detroit Newspaper Agency, or the Michigan Chronicle newspaper be designated for the following routine advertisements. A, notice of budget hearing and truth and taxation hearing. B, invitation for bids. C, request for proposals. And that Plymouth Canton Observer or the bond buyer or the Detroit Legal News as required be designated for public publication of a call for redemption of bonds b sale sale of bonds c sale of tax and anticipation notes and uh, a and the invitation for bids for major renovations additions and new constructions pa 232 of july 21st 2004 requires schools to post construction solicitation for minimum of two weeks on the state of Michigan's Sigma Michigan website. Okay, I'm looking for a second. Okay, so it was moved and seconded and member Brooks read it for us. So all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right, so we are done with our, with that, with our organizational meeting. Um, for people who have not seen this before, we only do this once a year. Um, <laughs> But we, we are required by law to have this meeting and to read the, read these things out. Which you can also find on the website if you'd like to browse the bylaws later. All right, so now we are on to um, call the meeting to order. Um, we did our roll call before our organizational meeting. Um, so we'll be on to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so now we are on to um, A, which is adoption of agenda and approval of consent agenda. Action item 220701. Madam President, I move that we adopt the agenda and the approval of the consent agenda, action item number 22-07-01. Thank you, I'm looking for a second. Second. All right, it was moved by member Sidhu and seconded by member Chastain that we adopt the agenda and approve the consent agenda, action item 22-07-01. Can you take us through it, please? Yes, this evening the consent agenda consists of human resources transactions since our last time together. We have new hires for your consideration as well as the replacement of the safety and security manager. We have resignations and retirements. We also have the approval of minutes from our special meeting on June the 17th, our special meeting on June the 21st, and our regular meeting minutes from June the 22nd. This evening, we also have first reading policies for your consideration. That is policy 2450, community and adult education, Policy 3362.01-4362.01, threatening behavior towards staff members. This is a new policy. We have policy number 6325, which is procurement federal grant funds. Policy 6350, 
Prevailing Wage Coordinator, Rescind Policy 68006800, Unbalanced and System of Accounting, Policy 7450, Property Inventory, and Policy 7455, Accounting Systems for Fixed Assets. We also have the following action items for your consideration. The first is the consideration of the approval of a resolution for Michigan High School Athletic Association, that's the MHSAA, for the year 8-1-21 through 7-31-22. First and final reading, this is the membership. The approval of a resolution for the extension of superintendent's contract. The consideration of an approval for the tentative agreement with the Plymouth Canton Educational Association, as well as the approval of a tentative agreement with the Plymouth Canton Plant Engineers, MFT and SRP, AFT Local 6094. All right, thank you so much. Uh, all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Dr. Martadian Gibbs. Good evening, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to some new teachers in our district. And as you know, we are continuing to hire champions for our schools, for our students, and for all of our stakeholders. So if you are here, if you could stand and be recognized, Michael Edwards. Michael Edwards is our new high school orchestra teacher. He will be at Canton High School. He comes to us with five years of experience as well as a bachelor's degree in Eastern Michigan University. He will also be supporting the middle school orchestra program. Welcome, Michael. Elena Frey will be a new speech pathologist at Isbister School. She comes with 13 years of experience as well as a bachelor's and a master's degree from Michigan State University. Gwen Coy. She is our new occupational therapist at the elementary school. She comes with 25 years of experience and a bachelor's degree from Eastern Michigan University. Kayla Latin. Kayla will be a new resource room teacher at Salem High School. She will also be a co-teacher at Salem High School. She has 10 years of experience from Dearborn Public Schools as well as her bachelor's degree from Eastern Michigan University. Welcome. Eddie Lee. Eddie is a brand new resource room teacher at Plymouth High School. He will also be a co-teacher at Plymouth High School and he comes to us with a bachelor's degree from University of Michigan. Heather Rolu. Heather, I just read, you just recently got married, Dibler. Okay, well congratulations on that. A new job and a wedding, that's awesome. <laughs> Speech pathologist at Farron School. She comes with five years of experience as well as her bachelor's and master's degree from Central Michigan University. Mackenzie Sebastian. Mackenzie will be a speech pathologist at Dotson and Gallimore Elementary Schools. She and Farron. And where else? And Farron. Oh, great. Well, welcome. <laughs> we have 14 elementary schools. You can take them all. Huh? It's, all it's all good, Mackenzie. So um, uh, bachelor's and master's degree from Eastern Michigan University, as well as 13 years of experience. So welcome to all of our new teachers. So. Besides hiring all you awesome people, we also finally get to give out candy bars again. It's something we like to do, but we've made a couple of mistakes. So if we do not have a candy bar for you, know that we are getting a special one for you and you will get it very soon. So I apologize for that. Next, I would like to recognize Mr. Eric Koki. Mr. Eric Koki is our new safety and security manager for our school district. He will be working with Josh Meyer, as well as Kurt Tuskowitz. He comes to us with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Madonna University. He was a police officer for 25 years and seven of those years as a police sergeant. He's a certified ALICE instructor. In fact, he has trained so many of us in the school district and it was a phenomenal um, training by Mr. Koki. He also has 25 years as an instructor in the police department and is also was a member of the Western Wayne County SWAT team. So welcome, Eric Koki. 
And Eric, you are one of the people who do not have a candy bar, but we'll get you one. <laughs> I don't need it. I like, I like it that you can already handle that. Okay. Awesome. I would like to recognize Mr. Brian Reed. He has taught English at Salem High School for over 30 years, and he decided to retire. So congratulations, Brian. Thank you. All right. Um, welcome, all the new hires. That's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to the fall. And Ms. Rail is passing out the candy. Excellent. Pardon me? I also would like to um, recognize the work that was done to have two tentative agreements brought forward to the Board of Education. So work by Kurt Tiskowitz and his team for our plant engineers contract. So thank you for that. And also the work for the teachers contract. I appreciate our union president, Heather, her awesome team, the team that I brought forward. And we just worked really hard together on some really tough stuff to make some good decisions um, for our teachers who are the ones who work with our students every single day. I am proud to announce under the leadership of Heather that we have an 87% yes vote. That's a big deal in our district. So congratulations to everyone and I appreciate the board and all the leaders in this district for all of their support to make this happen. Thank you. And we'd like to make sure we all recognize the hard work Dr. Bartani and Gibbs does towards getting all of these things done also. Um, so it's a lot of work to get this, these kinds of contracts done. All right, so now we are on to B, which is board committee reports and actions. So first up is the president's report. It's been kind of quiet, school is out. Um, so it has been, you know, it's been quiet. Um, I just wanted to mention that on our agenda, we did have a resolution for the superintendent's contract extension. We met June 17th and we did the superintendent evaluation and um, she was rated as effective. And so with our contract, it rolls over for another year and that, so we have to do this resolution um, every year and just to make sure that that's what we were doing. So we did, we are required to finish the evaluation by June 30th, um, which is state law, which we did. Um, and so the superintendent's um, evaluation also rolls in the, um, the growth of all the teachers in the district. So um, considering that that is 40% at this point, um, it, it's a you know, good evaluation. So, um, and so we're happy she will be here for several more years now. Um, pardon me? At least. Well, <laughs> she's locked in. <laughs> She's locked in for that. Um, but, you know, ideally we'll have people that retire here um, because having um, stable leadership is always really helpful to a district. Um, you can get more done. Um, and that's really kind of it for my report. Um, then we'll move on to uh, committee. So student performance and achievement. I have no update and also we will be um, having new chairs for the committees this at the end of this month, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will let the chair of the SPOC committee determine the next meeting date. All right, so the next one is policy committee, so we have not met either. Our next meeting will be, however, August 31st. Um, that is going to be committee of the whole, so other board members are more than welcome to attend. You do not have to, but you are welcome. Uh, we, were, we are going to be discussing the, the hard work that Dr. Bertini and Gibbs and Dr. Lilly have been doing on um, updating our equity policies. And so this gives everybody on the board a chance to weigh in and ask any questions. So it'll be 5.30, it will be here, um, barring anything that happens. And then um, finance and operations. Mr. So we have not met as a committee since our last board meeting, but we do have the date for our next FNO meeting. That will be August 5th. Uh, like the other committees, we'll be uh, opening up to new members uh, and people that are interested in that process. Please let, let us know. All right. 
And so just to reiterate, we're also going to redo our um, Legislative Action Committee, um, which Ms. Chastang has agreed to chair. So I'll be sending out an email and if people want to change committees um, or if they'd like to volunteer to chair a committee, that will be your chance to do that at that time. So just to keep thinking about, you know, the opportunities we have. So <coughs> that will become another committee. Um, so now we are on to administrative reports. Uh, Ms. Barrett. Thank you. I just want to begin by thanking our Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Beth Rails, for leading a phenomenal summer program. We have so many camps and opportunities, summer academies happening for our young people. Had an opportunity to visit the classrooms and seeing the learning that's going on in person, the excitement. Um, with some changes that we've made, some kids are able to see each other face to face. Um, just really experiencing some dynamic learning and I think as we consistently talked about the social emotional uh, piece and the trauma that many of our kids have experienced throughout this pandemic, having this sense of normalcy and their return has really been something that is truly inspiring to watch. I want to invite any board members throughout this summer, if you are available and interested to come see some of the programs that are happening, please just let us know. We can go for a tour tomorrow. We're going over to Liberty, I believe, to take a look at some summer academy opportunities and just hearing from the kids and the things that they're doing, um, just amazing. So I want to thank you for your leadership and all of these opportunities for our students. With our summer program, it really has provided a wonderful opportunity for us to begin planning for um, our fall re-entry. As you know, at our last meeting, you as a board um, unanimously agreed upon our return plans for the fall, and we're all excited to announce to our community that we are returning for five full days of instruction here, uh, pre-K through 12th grade and post-secondary as well. At that time, we talked about our mitigation strategies and the reason really being intentional about not releasing our fall communication so early, just realizing, although at the time we're really embracing and excited about the low transmission that we're experiencing within COVID, wanting to make sure that we waited on guidelines that came forward from the state, we knew that those were coming, as well as the CDC, and getting closer to the start of the school so that when we announce plans, we're not putting our families through announcing something that we have to then turn and pivot um, at another time. You know we heard loud and clearly so many um, times that we had to pivot last year. It was frustrating for many, so we want to make sure that uh, we get communication out early, but have some stability with that communication. So um, following the lifting of the pandemic orders from the governor last month and the guidelines that was released from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, our team went to, to work to really develop some guidance for our summer school protocols. The big change was a mask um, requirement that we removed and that actually was effective today. Um, prior to that, with under the public order that was in effect, we were working with people that were vaccinated, did not have to wear masks, but students, and of course all of our students under the age of 12, did not have the opportunity to be vaccinated. So following that, effective July 21st, um, although we still encourage, strongly encourage the wearing of masks, especially for those that are unvaccinated, um, we are saying that that is not required and giving that as an opportunity for our parents to, and, and guardians to make those decisions for those students. Um, we released this information for our summer school families directly to them. We put these guidelines also on our website. Um, I shared these guidelines with the board on July 2nd through um, board meeting, I mean through board notes. But I wanted to just give an opportunity to talk about those um, because as we review these guidelines, we get the data around uh, summer school and how these mitigation strategies are working, it would be our goal to continue to move those forward as a recommendation for the fall. Recognizing as it's been the case throughout the pandemic, the decision could be subject to change just based on what's going on with transmission data. So this evening, um, I wanted to invite uh, Director Meyer to come forward and just kind of walk us through those mitigation uh, protocols that we currently have in place for summer school. I will say the most exciting thing for the last three weeks is we are zero COVID cases, zero close contact Yay. quarantines. So you see he looks so much more relaxed <laughs> than the last time that he was gone. Um, so we'll just kind of go through these. Um, get any questions that you may have, any feedback. What I would like to suggest is if you have some ideas on things that you would like tweaked or for us to consider as we finalize this process, 
that we can get to a level of comfort um, to really determine if we can move forward and share the first week in August as we uh, communicated to our families that we would our intention. So, so just, just real quick for people who are watching, if you're interested in where they are, if you go to the front page of the district website, there's like learn, prepare, thrive, that section, and it's the first one It says update COVID protocols for students, families, and PCCS summer programs, and it will link you right to that page. You wanted to follow along. Well, good evening, board, and thank you, Ms. Merritt, for the opportunity. Um, as Ms. Merritt said, the, the last year, I started in October, and it's been a whirlwind. It's been changes after changes after changes. Some days are difficult to keep up with. Um, you know we talk about the pivoting and that can be frustrating for parents just as frustrating as it has been for our staff and for our teachers and for our administrators and what oftentimes happened last year is we would see a change from the michigan department of health and human services and that change wasn't consistent with the county health department it wasn't consistent with my osha and so as a district we're trying to take these changes and we're trying to implement them in a district where we have to implement something that could be different for our students, that's different from our staff, that's different from what the county is expecting us to do. And sometimes these changes would come out at 10 o'clock on a Friday morning and they would tell us, oh, they're retroactive to last week. And so we would now have to change quarantines and call any, you know, at one week, I think we had about 700 students in quarantine that we had to now call those families back and tell them that it was changing from a 14 day quarantine to a 10 day quarantine. And then a week later, we're back to a 14 day quarantine. And so. It's been frustrating, and, and I appreciate the board's support, the patients, and the district's support, and, and obviously our parents uh, who have had to endure this, and the students as well. And so it's been refreshing to get back this summer, see our students in classrooms, see their faces, see that they're not wearing masks, and actually be kids and, and get back to school. So with that, we started off the summer with some kind of about the same. It started off, you know, we had some changes in June. Um, June 12th, we released what was the new, latest and most greatest update for Michigan to help Department of Health and Human Services. And then on July 1st, the apple cart tipped over and it changed on us again. But yet that wasn't consistent with my OSHA. So while we had some mass restrictions lifted for students, we didn't have that for staff. We had conflicting information from the state as how that was going to uh, apply to school districts. And so we we made the decision to kind of hold back a little bit. Let's wait for more information from the county and from the state as to how these changes are impacting school districts because when we called Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, we were told there's a document that's gonna be released and these changes may be different for schools. So what we didn't wanna do is on July 1st, lift our mask um, requirements and then find out from the state that we're having to put those back on students that are unvaccinated or um, students that can't receive a vaccination. So. What's on, the, what's on the website is the latest and greatest. And what we did is we took what is now being looked at by the state and by the county, and that's the CDC data tracker by county. And it essentially lists four risk categories. There's low risk, uh, moderate risk, substantial risk, and high risk. And so when they rate your county, Wayne County is currently at a moderate risk level, and that's based off the current infection rates um, and, and what they're seeing in the county uh, currently. And so with my, through my conversations with the state and through the county, we've adopted those four risk categories, but it's really important as a district that we don't solely look at what's going on in Wayne County. And the reason being is when we look at the data for Wayne County, we're, we, we, the district serves Canton, Bulk, Plymouth. Those communities have a much higher vaccination rate than the rest of the county. And so when I spoke with the epidemiologists at Wayne County, what the recommendation was and what we came up with is the first place we should look when making a decision whether we should pivot from one risk category to another is what's going on in our school. Are we seeing infection rates going up in our school? Are we seeing positive cases? What are our quarantines looking like? How are both of those impacting learning in our, in our classrooms? What is the impact to the district? And then we should look at our, our communities. What is the infection rate in the camp community and the Plymouth communities? Our, our vaccinations continuing to go up, what does that look like? And then thirdly, look at the county. And then in consultation with the county, we can make a decision whether we should pivot to a, from one risk category to another. So for example, right now, Wayne County's at moderate risk level, but as a district, we're probably more in the low risk category because our class sizes are down because it's summer. We have less capacity in our classrooms, less capacity in our lunchrooms, less capacity in our buses. So we're not seeing the, the, the infection rates within the schools three weeks, three weeks of 
zero positive cases and zero quarantines. And that's something I think we should all be happy about and proud of because that, that, that number is not something we've seen since I've started in the district. Um, but those numbers are going down and the vaccinations and the efforts that we're making to, to offer vaccinations is helping. We had a vaccination clinic um, just before school got out. We had great numbers to that. Over 400 people um, showed up at that vaccination clinic. We're going to offer another vaccination clinic later this month um, with the second dose coming in August, which will be kind of our back to school vaccination kickoff, if you will, offering that to families within the district. Um, and so for this summer, as, as the superintendent pointed out, we took a look at those risk categories, we established them, and then for each category, above and beyond, let me back up. So there's mitigation strategies that we're going to continue to follow no matter what risk category we're in. That's self-monitoring. We want to make sure that if a staff member or a student has symptoms, they're not coming into school. That they're, they're waiting, they're getting tested, they're waiting for their symptom free to return to school. That's the biggest, one of the biggest strategies that we can we can all do to minimize, minimize the potential spread of the virus. The next thing we're going to do um, is continue to clean high touch points within the district. Uh, hand sanitation, all those things that we're continuing to do or that we've been doing, we're going to continue those mitigation strategies. Then when you roll into each of the um, categories, whether it's low, moderate, high, we look at what are our required uh, mitigation strategies and what are our recommended mitigation strategies and so we still have to maintain three feet of distancing that's a requirement in the state so all of our things start off at, at low we start right at that three foot threshold if we start getting into moderate or substantial or high we have to start to look to increase that social distancing requirement so that we're, we're taking steps to mitigate that spread right now because not all of our students are vaccinated, fully vaccinated and we have a population of students that can't even get the vaccination yet. It's recommended again, but not mandatory that staff and students continue to wear masks in the classroom, especially when we can't maintain that six feet of social distancing. Because close contact, well, we can drop down to three feet, but a close contact by definition is still that six foot requirement. So it's six foot, 15 cumulative minutes over a 24 hour period that's how they're determining a close contact currently. And that would require quarantine. So in the classroom, we can drop down to three foot. We would not have to quarantine a student if, if the student and the, and the positive person were both wearing masks. If one or the other was not or both were not, then we would have to do quarantines. So in a current classroom situation, if we're at a three foot distancing, which most of our classrooms are this summer, that's the, minimum threshold we're trying to make sure that we're doing six feet where we can especially in particular when we're when we're doing lunch and things like that but in a situation where let's say we're at three feet four feet and the two students were not wearing masks the positive student would be off like normal but then we would have to look at that any student within that three foot that wasn't wearing a mask as a close contact um, and they would be quarantined as such and that's the county protocol currently um, as we get up and we start to look at those other risks, the idea here is that we will monitor. So on the you know going forward, we're making some changes to the COVID toolbox, um, and the idea is to have this posted on the website. Currently, is eventually we would like to put where the district is. You know we're at currently at a low or a moderate, and then my staff along with Patrice, our nurse manager, will continue to monitor our cases within the district. We'll monitor what's occurring in the county and we'll be in constant weekly communication with the Wayne County Health Department. If we see where the county pivots from, let's say to, from moderate to substantial, that's gonna trigger us to look at what's going on within the district and what's going on within our three communities. And from there, we'll have dialogue and conversation as to whether it makes sense to move the district up with the county or to stay where we're at based on number one first and foremost what's going on with our, in our in our schools with our students and what are we what are we seeing and then what's happening in those two other categories um, and then we'll adjust those those um, requirements and recommendations as needed um, what we look for um, in particular as we start to move into substantial and high is when we went back and we looked at uh, let's say from November to the end of the school year, where were we seeing our, our most prevalent rates of infection? And, and a lot of times it was, um, you know, we saw a lot in athletics. 
especially when we had the close contact indoor sports, basketball, hockey, uh, those athletics, we were seeing a lot of transmission. Um, when we started transitioning to outdoor athletics, we saw, we saw those athletic numbers kind of taper off and we weren't seeing them as prevalently as we were earlier in the year. And so as we start to get up there, some of the recommendations are is that we're gonna start to look at those indoor athletic programs. Where are we at? Is this, is this January where we have hockey and we have basketball occurring and should we look at mandating masks for indoor athletics? Uh, are we seeing numbers within our athletic programs going up? Um, as we get into substantial, we're gonna offer opportunities for testing. Um, there's, another, there's a new PCR test that's now available um, that's a saliva-based test, so it's no longer the nose swab. Um, it's something that a student can do themselves. They can put it in the thing, they can return it, and they get a, they get a, a reading within 24 to 72 hours. Um, so that's an opportunity that we can offer to our students and staff later on in the year should it become necessary uh, based off what's going on with the transmission rates. So that's kind of the long explanation. I'll, I'll answer any questions you may have. I think we really, I'm glad we took the time to really look at this. Um, and I'm glad we had the time to really look at this because I think we have a really, in my opinion, we have a really robust approach to see what happens over the summer and then look at this as a learning opportunity to see maybe what can be tweaked, what should be changed as we transi transition to bring our students back into the classrooms uh, in the fall. One thing my staff is looking to do is put together, working with Patrice to put together um, not only updates to the COVID toolbox because that, um, I'll be honest, it got hard to manage last year and it was frustrating for our parents sometimes to try to find information on there. But as we were trying to keep up with the daily grind of managing cases, um, that, that COVID toolbox was managed um, by Nick and one of our nurses. And so as we were trying to manage just getting out communications and working with the health department, it got, there was sometimes old information on there. So we've had a really good opportunity this summer to look at that and, and figure out how we want to change that and then really kind of going with one document and then we're updating one document versus having to update multiples on the website. And so we would have, like, if you look at the document, it's got links, it links you to, um, you know, the first one is the link to, to help, you know, that's from the MDHHS. And then there's a link that will take you right to the CDC tracker by county. Um, all the way, there's links for all of our reporting forms. There's links for the daily screening forms. and so. The idea going forward is, is when we get a new screening form, which believe it or not, at one point in time, we were getting a new one twice a week from the county, which changes. Um, and so we would have to go into the toolbox and pull the old one off, put the new one up. So now what we're hoping to do is have this one document on our website, where now we're just changing that link. If the quarantine data or the quarantine requirements change, all the way at the bottom of the document, there's a link to the county's current quarantine uh, guidelines. If those change, we would go into that document, update those, so the parents would would kind of know where to go on the website to find this information um, in, in, a, in a kind of a better flowing format. And so we got a little bit of work to kind of clean things up over the summer, but I think we got time, and I think we're off to a good start. And happy to answer any questions the board may have. One thing I do need to clarify um, with the requirements: what came out from the state? Well, they were recommendations or guidelines. So where you see on our um, strategies, the words requirements and recommendations, those are things that we've developed internally that we would then at the local level say, these are the basic requirements that we would have at this level and these are recommendations that we would have. Yeah, with the, with the elimination of the public health orders, as you know, the public health orders were backed by law. They had an MCL attached to them. So if, if somebody didn't follow a mask mandate, there was, there, there was potential, it's potentially a crime um, that, that could be investigated by the state of Michigan and somebody could be charged for that. Um, with those public health orders, you know, as a district, we don't have the authority to issue a public health order. It has to be issued by the state of Michigan, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, or Wayne County. And right now, Wayne County is kind of following the state's guidelines. So there are no current orders in place, even for school districts. And so we're having to look at that very closely as a district to, to ensure whatever we do is enforceable and it makes sense. Patrick. So first I want to thank you for this document because it does a great job of starting to bring all this stuff together in a more cohesive way and better communicating to this to the parents. And I think this is a really good start for what we can do for the fall. Um, I do have a couple of class questions and clarifications. 
you mentioned with respect to the quarantine process and uh, between three feet and six feet uh, uh, unmasked, um, that is uh, the, the, the process that there is. If I want to make sure I clarify and understand that. If it's less than three feet, masked or unmasked, then that's considered a close contact and you have to quarantine. No, thus we, we can't drop below three right, feet. If those three students, feet is. Right. I yes. know that our policy is not less than, but it's if people were closer than that. If people are closer than three feet, we need to spread them apart. We, uh, we, three feet is what we have to maintain. So if, if for some reason on recess, you know, sometimes students are going are gonna, to, that's right. going to happen. But in the classroom, we have to maintain that three feet of distancing. Okay. Um, if, if there's a case, like we'll use the playground, for example, if the kids are out playing and we know that they're in close contact, no mask, and, and they're less than three feet, then we have to do contact tracing for anybody that would have been in close proximity to that, to that student. Is that, I want to make sure I understand, is this masked or unmasked less than three feet, they're considered a close contact? If both, if both are wearing a mask, then it is not a close contact. If one or none are wearing a mask, then it becomes a close contact and it requires contact tracing. Perfect, thanks. And then if you're... I think I want to, I I want to add a little clarification, might need to go back, um, because there's also a couple of different guidelines. The three feet for close contact was just for a classroom scenario. Correct. So if we're in a cafeteria, then that shifts that you would still be... Um, considered a quarantine under six feet, correct. for example. Okay, so correct. three feet became a classroom Got in it. the Wayne County Health Department. And also with the three feet of spacing, it's still from CDC, from Health Department, a recommendation or a guideline, but we have internally said we staff for three feet before that came out. So we're using the internal work requirement. I just don't want that to come out in the community and say, hey, that's not actually a state requirement. Perfect. That's a Perfect. Thank you so much for that clarification. And the related one, is for those students that are fully vaccinated, are they required to uh, to quarantine? No, not currently under the current quarantine guidelines. If you are fully vaccinated, you are not required to quarantine. Okay, great. So that's so there's the two mechanisms that we that students can use to, or three mechanisms they do, can use to protect themselves, is to be outside of six feet from an infected person, to be fully vaccinated, or to be masked. Correct. Or if you've had COVID within the previous five months, then oh, you would be four, four mechanisms. Yep, and, and, and just so everybody's clear, in order for that per parameter to be in place, the student would have to show proof of a positive PCR. So antigen testing is, is not a valid um, mechanism for us to say that person was COVID positive. It has to be a positive PCR within the previous five months, and that comes directly from Wayne County. Okay, and what our planning is for the fall and I know we're probably better than this in the summer because of the lower capacity, but our planning for the fall is to have everybody be three feet, but we're not guaranteeing that everybody will be six feet. So if you're unvaccinated you, if you, and you don't want to be quarantined, then a mask is appropriate. Correct. Because the risk, there's a risk. I mean, it's probably a much lower risk with low transmission, I'm sorry, low, uh, low, yeah, low um, COVID, um, yeah, the risk levels, the, the substantial risk levels, the low or the moderate, there's probably very little risk associated with that because there's very little COVID in the community. But as you head into those higher levels, then the risk goes up and you have more chance of being quarantined at that uh, process if you're unmasked. That's correct. Yeah. And we have to look at things like, um, like Superintendent Merritt said, our, our lunchrooms. Um, you know, right now it's not a big issue because they're not packed. But when we get back to school, the capacity within our lunchrooms during lunchtime is going to go up. Our bus transportation capacity is going to go up. Right. And so what we have to what we have to be aware of and what we have to continue to monitor is when that when we start making that shift to return to school, um, you know, can the bus windows be open? Obviously in the middle of winter, not a good idea. And when and when we have a bus at capacity with the windows down, that poses a greater risk of the transmission of the virus. So those are all things that as a district we windows up. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, did I say windows down? Yes. Yeah, windows down. In the wind, middle of winter with the windows up, that's a greater you know, greater risk of transmission of the virus. So we have to be aware of that. We have to, you know, when, when we start getting to that time frame, really watch our risk levels closely um, and adjust accordingly. Um, but again, it's a lot of this is incumbent upon, um, you know, parents to, to make decisions that's best for their kids. And if you feel like you're you're, you know, you don't want your child quarantined, then there's measures that you can put into place to try to prevent that um, from occurring. Um, and that's, you know, wearing masks, vaccinations, if you're able to, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 
Great. And I'll have more questions. I'll let others ask theirs. Sean, do you have any questions? Uh, just a couple. Um, and you may have hit on these, but uh, the additional mitigation strategies of air purifiers, I know we invested quite a bit in that. Uh, and then, of course, early on in returning to school, the weather is going to be pretty nice. You know, I say that with a wink because it's Michigan. Uh, but it, it could be nice. And so, you know, there's an opportunity to allow the youth to utilize the picnic tables that, that we, is that in the mitigation strategy uh, as so, well? Those yeah, so the, yes, sir. So the air purifiers are going to, those are going to remain in place. We made that investment. Those are going to remain in place. Um, as far as use of picnic tables, those are strategies that we're looking at and how the, how, you know, those are building decisions that we have to look at to see how we can implement those. Uh, we're going to make all those recommendations. Um, we look to put a document out to our building administrators and staff towards middle to end of August that's going to kind of give some of these recommendations. They're going to say, hey, as a building, you should consider these things as mitigation strategies as well. Th use of the 360. Um, we're still going to use the 360 cleaning machines um, in high touch point areas at the request. If we have, if we end up at um, uh, one of the schools calls and we have a positive case. We're gonna we're gonna deploy the 360 and clean those areas and clean those rooms where that student was, um, and so we're gonna continue to use those mitigation things that we have and we made investments in because they work and we we know we have them available and so there's no reason not to use those at this point. Great. And then last question, uh, the upcoming uh, vaccination. How and this might be a Mr. Brandon question, but how are we promoting that voluntary? Uh, you know, vaccination day to our to our students to really try and allow parents and, and youth who want the vaccination to, to know about it and be able to register in advance, or is it walk up? What's so we, we learned a we learned a valuable lesson last time. Um, the county was not so when we put this out last time, um, Nick and his team were gracious enough to advertise that, and the county wasn't really expecting great numbers. Um, and we looked at our, so we did a pre-registration just so that we could track how many people were going to be in our building because that was a concern of ours. And we looked at it, I don't know, like 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning and we were at like 50. And by 6 o'clock that night we had jumped up to almost 700 people. Um, and so we, uh, Nick and his team are going to are gonna advertise it again just like we did last time. We're going to do a pre-registration and we're going to monitor that closely and work with the county so that um, if we need to cut it off, we will or if we can get additional staffing in. So our nurses, um, I mean, it was pretty all hands on deck, the first clinic, our nurses all jumped in and were administering vaccinations. We had paramedics from the from the Canton Fire Department there administering vaccinations for us. And so um, really worked out well. We were able to get a lot, of, a lot of people vaccinated, but we want to monitor that just to make sure that we can accommodate the numbers that we're gonna see if we're gonna see high numbers. Um, but Nick um, and his team will, will advertise that just like we did on the website and through other a means for us to make sure we get that message out. Great. And uh, lastly, just kudos on uh, taking a moment to dissect, you know, everything that that happened, the the, the wins, the losses, and and then you know jumping on, putting out a plan, and starting to move towards that. So so well, well done. Thank you. Miranda. Well, all of my questions were asked. Um, I just have one question to ask and answer. But as you started to speak, a few more came up. So. All right. <laughs> Um, first, like as a board member, I'm very excited and proud of all the work that you all have done. As a parent, I am really excited and looking for clear, simple communication. So this is complex and it's a lot of new parts. So as the team thinks about how this is going to land and show up for parents, I would just ask them to make sure that it's clear and simple and easy for parents to follow, find, and understand because that was a frustration of mine and many other parents in the district. So you know, we've done amazing work. Let's make sure that it lands well because families do have options. Sure. We want our parents to feel like that they have options. A um, couple, couple thoughts that I have is you mentioned that if students are vaccinated, um, I think when Patrick was asking questions about like that close contact at the risk level, how do we know they're vaccinated? Because we can't ask it. So that's something that students self-report um, or like how would we know that? So that's a really good question. So we're working on right now, we're working with Mr. Tequiskwitz and our nurse manager. Um, so when we do the registration for return to school, um, one, we're looking at the possibility of having one of the questions be, is your student, be a voluntary answer, is your student vaccinated? 
And then from there, if the parent answers that, then our MyStar software, would we, we've already worked with Risa to update the MyStar software, so now there's an area where we can identify if somebody's been vaccinated. And so we're not looking to, to track this by any means, but in the event that we have to start quarantining, it's going to be helpful to know and, and, and not have to ask for vaccination records at the time when we're quarantining people, because essentially what the county has said, if we can't prove vaccination, then we fall on on air on side of caution quarantine. Um, and so hopefully the idea is that we'll have that implemented and when parents respond back, we'll be able to get that inputted into MyStar and, we'll, and our nurse case managers, because our nurses are doing a phenomenal job of managing these cases as they come in and the contact tracing, they'll be able to look at that student and see if they were vaccinated and then they can continue on with their school day versus being you know, quarantined for that day or, or subsequent days. Yeah, so we, um, so the first vaccination clinic was done by Wayne County and they, they kind of handled those partnerships. So we had, uh, as I said, we had people from their, the, the camp fire department. We had some people from the Beaumont Health System there assisting and we had Wayne County nurses and then school nurses. Um, we've reached out to, um, we've talked with, with various pharmacies, Kroger Pharmacy being one, and they've been willing to do vaccination clinics and things of that nature. It's just that with Wayne County having a, the supply that they do, um, they have a readily available supply and, and we can work with them. Um, one thing is, is that we're already set up as a, what they call point of distribution with Wayne County. Um, so the school district is one of the Wayne County point of distribution. So it's, it's a very good, easy transition for us to work with Wayne County because all of those things are already put in place and set up with, with the county. Um, so it makes it really seamless to have them come in and do those vaccinations for us at Salem High School. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anupam? Thank you. Um, I want to echo the phenomenal work that you've done and your team in putting all of this together. Uh, your explanation has been very helpful and thorough. So thank you for putting in all that time and effort. And also thank you for keeping up with all of the changes. I know it's been really, really difficult, and I want to thank you for just sticking or hanging in there. I mean, it was a rough year, but you've done great. Thank, thank you. you. It's like, I wish I could take all the credit, but we have a really, really, really good team here, and under the leadership of Ms. Merritt, it's been a pleasure and an honor to, to work for the district this, during these challenges. It's really, um, the team here being new, the team that really stepped up and helped out from, from our nurses all the way up to our core team and the leadership team. So, so yeah, and thanks to the team and the nurses, especially. I know it was really hard on them this past year. So thank you to everybody. So I want to say that to begin with. Um, I do want to pick up on what Member Chesting said about communication. One of the questions I have is in this great document that you put together, uh, are there opportunities for parents to get this information in different languages and also in different mediums? So. Um, as we think about the back to school, we are sitting here, we're digesting this. We have, you know, what, 16,000 plus kids and their family members. How do we, or what is the efforts um, that you are thinking about in terms of reaching all of the students and parents with what's in here? So I have to work with Nick and his team to build those communications as we, as we start to get closer to the school year. As Ms. Merritt said, middle, I'll kind of work with her leadership, but in the middle, mid-August, um, to get it out in different languages. That's something we did um, previously in the school year. Um, and so uh, our goal would obviously be to take this document and have it, you know, just like we did our um, screening sheets and some of the other documents, we had those translated into other languages so that we were reaching and, and touching all points of our communities. And so the goal would, the goal would obviously to do that um, um, it's kind of a fresh document, so we haven't had a, the time to do that. But that would be the goal of it before we return to school is to is to have that available and and readily communicated, you know, via via all the different sources that Nick and his team have available to them. We uh, for the summer communication, we created just um, a more modified version of what are the high level oh, documents. I saw that. 
and then we created a link to this for people to explore in their own time. So kind of highlight it. These are the things that you need to know, and then information to, to go in. Um, with this particular document, we had initially said we kind of no later than mid-August. If we can get a level of, of comfort here, and, and in terms of what we're seeing, if there's you know things we need to tweak, it would be ideal to even get this out the first week in August. So I can even do something this week to say, you know, at the meeting of Board of Education, we talked about we do have one more step that we'd like to do after we get feedback here, um, using our Wild School Committee that has um, you know we've been that's been in place all year. We have a, a local epidemiologist. Uh, you know, the healthcare officials on that, our nursing staff, running this document through them, having some conversations as well as get feedback, make any tweaks, and then would really like to think about releasing that the first week in August to say these are our planned um, mitigation strategies for the fall, recognize it, of course, and we always would put anything would be subject to change. But I think the positive point about this is because you see what would be the trigger and what would be the change that everybody would know in advance, you know, where, where we are. If I could just add one piece about translation, it's a live Google Doc, so it is translatable through Google Translate and any other uh, translation platforms that are available in various browsers. It's also ADA compliant, so it's written with ADA in mind, so screen readers can read the document properly as well. Right, um, but I always think about let's make it easy on our customers, so we can put a link in different languages with a PDF or um, even do a, an outreach to families, mail out a different language, and of course put the disclaimer that this is information as of this date, it will be modified as things change. Um, but I, I do want to comment on what Superintendent Merritt said, that I did, I thought I saw someone shared a picture of that little cheat sheet. I thought that was great. So we could have little cheat sheets be shared with families and it put a little QR code and say here's the updated document, here's the full five pages, so simplifying the initial communication, follow up with the full documentation. So I like that. And the timing works well too because it takes us about two weeks to get everything to the translators. Mm -hmm. So we work with um, the EL department and ensure that we have translations for as many languages as possible. So as we move forward together, then we'll get it to the EL department, we'll get all the translations and link those documents as well. Right. And, and then as we, you know, as we talked about, we would like to have one document going forward and then you know, you would see last updated on this date, but we would put out a summary of the updates. So you wouldn't necessarily have to read the whole document to see what changed in it. Here would be a summary that says, here's the three bullet points of the changes. The quarantine went from, from 14 days to 10 days or whatever it may be. And so it, it, we're, we're really trying to find ways to simplify that and, and make these communications better for our families that we serve. Well, that's great. Um, the one other question I have and a comment. So the vaccination initiative, by the way, congratulations on the success of the last one. So as you uh, share the vaccination initiative, and it, if that becomes full, is it possible to put in links to other sites, letting parents know if this is full, like if you can't get into our efforts, here are other places where you can go to get vaccinated. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that certainly could be done. If we work with Wayne County, I believe the last time, we were, we were like one of the last areas, but they share, I want to use probably wrong word, I don't know if it was a QR code, but they actually shared the different locations around the county and they gave us access to the flyers that we could communicate on their behalf as well. Perfect, perfect. Okay. And I think if we if we book this up, we would probably work with superintendent to try to schedule another date and, and bring them back out because the county is really eager to, as I said, it's a, it's a pod location for them, so it's real easy for them to come out and do it. We just, we have to schedule it and make sure we have staffing and we can handle it the day that it occurs. Okay, thank you. Um, the only comment I want to share with everyone and um, board members, parents, who was watching, is to really think about our kids and staff that are medically vulnerable or fragile. Um, we think about some of our kids that we don't know physically. Um, they look fine, but internally, they could be immunocompromised. I live with one. And so sometimes if you're seeing people wear a mask, don't assume that they're not vaccinated. There are other things that are going on. Um, the other thing is when kids come into school, especially for the age 12 or below 12, they could be going home to elder family members that are more vulnerable. So I want to just make sure that we respect people and their home situation, their, their personal health, and to, you know, not to assume that they're not vaccinated or they're coming from a family that's not vaccinated. So just to show some additional respect, that's all. I think it's a great point. I think also 
as we learned a lot last year that not, no one decision is going to satisfy all so as we rolled out the summer plans I've had emails that are very thankful and emails where people are still expressing a lot of concerns mm -hmm. and, and want us to keep the mask requirement and so for us just the continued communication or education around you know you know where this is the fact that it is something that we still you know because of our younger kids we use the word strongly encourage but at the same time you know families have a choice in the matter um, and just making sure that um, it is very clear as to, to um, the other layered strategies that we still have in place to just work to ensure that we can keep our environment as safe as possible. Doug? Yeah, I just want, wondering, uh, earlier you were talking about the um, close um, contacts with uh, 15 minutes uh, time factor. I was just kind of wondering who's keeping time of that, the, the people. Yeah, so How accurate, that seems to me kind of erroneous. Like, I know you can deal with contact tracing, uh, but um, the amount of time is, uh, I was just wondering how you can deal with that. Yeah, so it's a 15 cumulative minute. So again, it's some of that is on the honor system because we, we, don't, we don't have teachers with stopwatches um, on the playgrounds. Uh, we utilize our camera systems where we can. Uh, obviously, we don't have cameras in the classrooms, but we do have, where we used them a lot last year was on our buses. Uh, the camera systems on our buses became a great tool to identify close contacts. Um, and, and those cameras are all time stamped. So in those situations, we would look to see if that student was, you know, uh, 15 cumulative minutes. So, um, you know, was it a 15 minute ride, bus ride to school? Was it seven and a half minutes in the morning, seven and a half minutes in the night, in the evening or afternoon? And was, were the two kids sitting in close contact? So we can utilize that technology. Um, but then again, it's also required, re relying on our staff to monitor those situations and report accordingly. Um, classroom close contacts, obviously we look at the time that the students were in the classrooms. Our teachers keep seating charts. So those seating charts, when we do our contact tracing, become critical in identifying who was there, where were they sitting. And then obviously if they're in class for 45 minutes, half hour, then it becomes a close contact situation and the quarantine applies. Where it's tricky is on recess, lunch, things like that, but we do the best that we can. Uh, in those situations to identify and, and do the contact tracing. And the other thing that I, I hear uh, a lot lately about the um, vaccine being not certified um, um, by the government and a lot of people are hesitant on um, getting the vaccine. That's why we have a problem with um, the percentage of people. And uh, um, I was just uh, kind of wondering what we're doing about if we're keeping up with that and making sure that we provide our um, the parents and their uh, students with any kind of information that comes from the, um, the health organizations. Yeah, so when the, that issue. Yeah, so when we do the information that we put out on vaccinations comes directly from the Wayne County Health Department. So when we do our vaccination clinics, the information that we put out, they give us a flyer which contains what vaccination um, they're going to be administering that day, and then there's a frequently asked questions about that vaccination. It lists the side, it, it, it's a pretty comprehensive document that goes through all those nuances for families to be able to make an informed decision. As far as keeping up with it, you know, we do our best. I, I like anybody else, I try not to watch the news, but you know, every day there's something new on, you know, yesterday there was a new complication from the Johnson & Johnson vaccination. And so it's constantly trying to stay up on that. But being that I'm not a, a, a doctor or a scientist, I really rely on the Wayne County Health Department and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to put that information out. Um, and we were, we're happy to attach that when we do vaccination clinics or forward that out, but it's it's really tough for us to to put together a document or put together that information because it's not really my wheelhouse, um, so to speak. Um, well, thanks for all the work you're doing. Great. So most of my questions were already answered, but I do want to just thank you for this. And I agree with the other board members, the sooner we can get this out to families, the better because this is a lot of information to digest and that way if they have questions you know they can get them answered ahead of time and also to Loranda's point the simpler it can be because it is a lot you know when you're reading all the back to school things it's just a lot of information that you try to digest and so the sooner and the simpler it can be the better off it will you know it just it just make it e as easy as possible for the parents and caregivers 
and families to get all the information they need and get all their questions answered. And then it's, it's just much smoother start to the year. But thank you for this. This is a lot of, of good work. And I do like it in like one document where you can link it because you can then, you're not, you know, finding a lot of different things, which makes it a little easier for people to see. Patrick, do you have more questions? I do still. Um, on the subject of communications, I, I echo your, your feedback, and I, I'm really excited, Ms. Mary, that you know, even pre-messaging to the community that we're going to send something to them in the beginning of August would be really important for us, because it lets people know that there's been great work that's been going on this summer, we're seeing positive outcomes of that. Our community has done a great job with vaccination and keeping transmission low, and this is what we're intending to do um, so that we can kind of let people know that this is coming and they know when to look out for it. Because most of our messaging has been, we're going to tell you before school. But I think if we can be more certain that we're going to tell you in the first week of August, I think that would be super, super helpful for people. Um, and to let them know about the things that are happening. I did have a few questions still. You mentioned um, continuous versus uh, cumulative. We historically have been, if I remember correctly, have been using the continuous contact as directed by the Wayne County Health Department. There was 15 minutes continuous uh, 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 contact for quarantines versus 15 minutes cumulative. But I heard you here tonight talking the cumulative number, which is what the CDC recommends. So has that changed? Yeah, that was a change that the, so yeah, you were correct. The county was 15 consecutive minutes. On June 1st, that I believe it was June 1st, um, that changed from, I can tell you, I think they're going to yeah, Yet another change. <laughs> yet another change. Which potentially could change again. <laughs> uh, on the memorandum that the county put out on June 1st, it changed from 15 consecutive to 15 cumulative minutes over a 24 hour period. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that because I know that we've talked so extensively about. Uh, uh, consecutive or um, versus cumulative and so now that that has changed it does as uh, I think it was Mr. Brooks or maybe Aranda that asked the question it's much harder to track Correct. and so people wearing those masks or getting vaccinated are probably our best mechanism to help manage those quarantines in that uh, in that process okay and then the next question I had was um, when we're promoting our information about these processes can we promote the uh, MI COVID alert application? You know, so many of our students, especially at the middle and high school level, are using mobile phones, and the MI uh, COVID alert app ties into your uh, your phone and automatically detects those those close contacts for you. And so it, it's a way to let people be self-notified of whether they have that contact, and it's a way that they can, if they have their mobile device with them, they can then have that information and, and help to help our contact tracers and our nurses to uh, ease their burden in that process. So it's not a perfect uh, story, but it certainly helps with that, uh, that proactive notification and helps people to know whether they might have been inadvertently uh, in contact and help with that contact tracing. Yeah, so um, it's certainly something we can look into. I, I'm, I'm familiar with it, just to say that I know it exists and I know it uses cell towers and um, I don't have the app, so I'm not really too familiar with how accurate it is. Yeah. Um, it, it, I've had it for over a year and it never gave me a alert. I know that's just <laughs> No, I think that it's actually, it depends on whether other people are using yeah. it. So the app, the app works through, uh, through the operating system in the phone and the Bluetooth on the phone. So it knows the proximity to you to the other phones that are next to you there. So it's really, if, if more people use it, then it gets more valuable. If you're the only person that uses it, it's useless. And I think it requires the positive person to somehow they have to input acknowledge that they're positive for it to be able to track from the cell tower. Correct. Um, yes. So that's it's, exactly what happened. So it is, yeah. does require self-reporting, but it does help with that tracking. And I mean, we're, we're so lucky right now that we're in a period of low transmission um, or, or, or moderate transmission, and so we we are in a great situation. But when we look at other states and we look at other countries, we're seeing that curve almost like a, a, a near vertical. Uh, where the number of cases have just gone up so exponentially. I think our community and our state has done a great job with getting vaccinated and taking the right precautions and we're not seeing that problem. And I really would hate to see us go into that substantial or, um, or high transmission rate because that's what puts all this hard work at risk. And, and you know, I think our focus is, that I've seen and I see this in the documents and everything else is 
Let's have kids in school. Let's have kids in school without masks. Let's have all the things done that we only layer on those additional protections as we see the transmission, uh, as we see the risk levels go up. So I think this is the right uh, graduated process there. And I think that was, uh, and I, I, the last thing I wanted to thank you for is the change log. You know, knowing that the document was updated is great. Putting a, an appendum, a addendum at the end that says what changed is super, super helpful. We've, we've had a lot of documents that have grown <coughs> Over the over the school year, whether it be our FAQs or our other things, but we don't. You know, we have an updated date, but if you don't know what changed, you're reading through a multi-page document trying to figure out what happened uh, from the last time you looked at it. So putting that in the document would be super helpful. Thank you. Um, I will share just some um, earlier feedback. Uh, one area that we're looking at is the substantial area that might just be tweaked. Um, it's pretty clear when you're at low when you're at moderate and when you're at high but when you get into the substantial area um, the language that we currently have uh, printed we've been talking about really triggering conversations that we may consider something differently so I, I know yeah I, I, I think that what you mentioned of getting the back to school committee and talking to the pediatricians and the epidemiologists that's the one area that I had some concern on but I'm not an expert in that process so I think there's an opportunity for us to talk to the experts and see whether um, we need to make adjustments at that substantial risk level. Um, you know, if we look at the, the trends that we saw over the school year, when we saw our highest number of cases, we were either in high or in substantial transmission levels. And so you know, we, did, we saw little to no when we dropped down to moderate and to, uh, to, to, to low. So I think that, that that advice will help us there. One other thing, Ms. Merritt, that I saw in our um, in our teacher agreement is, is that we have some new flexibility with respect to the way we're doing quarantine uh, uh, instruction. Can you share what that means for the community? Because I know that that had been, uh, fingers crossed, no quarantines, no transmission, no kids out. But if we do have people that have extended absences or we have uh, uh, the unfortunate situation of quarantine, how are we going to support the education process for our students going forward? So I'll ask uh, Dr. Bartini to get the details, but the idea, I do know that the team worked together to really come up with some stronger options um, to, to, to support some students, and Dr. Bartini gives maybe. Sure, we absolutely worked with um, the negotiating teams to look at different ways to support absent students, and through this tentative agreement that um, the board members have voted yes on, so thank you for that, we will be providing some choices for teachers on how they will support students that need to be quarantined or who have an excused absence. And the academic support will be aligned to the class that you're in. And the teachers shall offer one of the following, live stream, two-way communication, remote access to the classroom, and or provide pre-recorded lessons which students can do asynchronously. Also, we are going to be doing some work with um, our chief academic officer and her team to really look at what the best instructional practices are during the next school year to think about other ways we can support students during quarantines. But these are the three options a teacher will have, as well as there will be a, a button on our Canvas page that says when absent that students can go to. And just to be clear, that's not just quarantines, it's any extended absence, right? Any excused it's, it's, absence. And I think it has to be three, three, three days? Three or more consecutive school days, okay. which is aligned to the K-12 student handbook. Great, so if kids are out in an extended uh, illness or other health condition or what have you, then they've got a better opportunity to get um, education in that time. Absolutely, this will align to what students need and also support teachers to give choice to um, what works best for their classroom situation. That's great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Does anybody have any more questions? All right, just to summarize again, um, I will do a pre-communication uh, to all families that would just share you know, what's going on in the summer in anticipation of um, as we monitor that this would guide our, our, our guidance in the fall. We'll plan to communicate out fall mitigation strategies the first week in August, um, making sure that we're simplifying those communications, continuing with adding leaks. We do have one more, 
work group that will take place just to review our current summer mitigation strategies. That's our wallet school committee offer any additional tweaks. I share that, of course, with board through board notes, but then plan that communication going forward. So thank everyone for an extremely uh, challenging year, but what looks like a very promising return to some sense of normalcy as we move forward for the 2021 school year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so now we are at finance and operations. So we have an action item, action item 220702, consider approval of resolution to purchase 14 school buses from 2019 series bond fund to final reading. So I'm looking for a motion. Madam President, I'd um, like to make a motion to consider approval of a resolution to purchase 14 school buses from 2019 series bond funds final reading. Okay. Action item 220702. Looking for a second? Second. All right, it's been moved by Member Brooks and seconded by Member Kehoe. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? We did discuss it at our last meeting. Just as a reminder to everybody, we are not getting rid of the old buses right now. All right. Uh, all in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed say no. All right. Motion passes. Five zero. Um, so now we are at D, which is citizens' comments. I do not have any cards. Um, well, papers. Is there anybody who wanted to make a comment and did not fill out a card? I will. Come on up. And then uh, Mr. Brandon will get you the, the form. Yeah. Or, um, I'd like to not be timed because three minutes is really not enough. Um, and I'm not going to be long. But no, when do we as parents get to ask oh, questions and get feedback from you? Because... So this a is statement is not three, enough. Our three minutes. I know, but I would like to ask that question. When do we get to have a conversation and ask our questions and get answers rather than an email? Like you said before, we should get all that info out to parents so that they can get their questions answered. How do they get their questions answered besides just emailing and getting a generic email back? Um, if you'd like, like to have a phone conversation, we can definitely engage in a conversation. Give me a call. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then I'd just like to, maybe you guys can write these questions down and we can talk about it at a later date, but what accountability measures are you putting in place for teachers who are overstepping their boundaries? I have heard story after story with parents that I'm meeting with who, and actually from other teachers who have chosen not to get vaccinated, that teachers are shaming them because they chose not to get the vaccine and that's really not okay. And that should also, for the kids 12 and older, that shouldn't go to them either at high school. Teachers should not be asking that or shaming teachers or students because they chose not to get vaccinated. And also if we don't wear masks, which hopefully we won't, teachers should not be shaming children either for their choice to not wear a mask. And then also, um, I've heard several stories on teachers talking about their political beliefs and um, sharing those with children and that's really not their place. And so what are you guys doing to kind of observe in the classroom? What kind of consequences do they have for that or, or sitting down with them? Like, that's not okay. Um, and also, if you say that masks are required, but there is no order, I'd like to know what happens if a student or parent refuses to mask. There's no order, but you as a district say you have to wear it, but a student shows up and their parent says they will not wear a mask to school, what will happen? And then also just open communication. We talked last time about the nobody knows about these board meetings. And on Tuesday, and I appreciate you guys getting back to me quickly when I asked, but I went on the website and you couldn't find the meeting anywhere. And I, my husband and I were like, we saw the meeting before, it's not on there. So if I hadn't said anything, it would not have been added to the website. Where and how are people finding out about these meetings if it's not even on the website? So 
That is another thing that you guys need to think about because the parents, you are representing the parents of this district. And if they aren't given a chance to speak or even know that this meeting is happening, if parents weren't able to check the website from Tuesday when it finally got posted, they would not even know to come here today. And that is not okay. So I look forward to our conversation to answer some of these questions, but just to give you guys something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, so the next, um, we are to E, which is action items discussions. We have no action items. Um, we have future agenda topics. Does anybody have one that they have not communicated yet? If not, you can always um, email Ms. Merritt with them and she will add them to our draft calendar. Um, so then we have follow-up board questions. We had no follow-up board questions from our last meeting. Uh, so that is it. So at this point, we are going to, we have concluded this agenda for our regular meeting. We are going to adjourn to a special meeting on start and end times. This is a workshop meeting, so just for people to understand. We are not, this is a dis, more of a discussion meeting. We're not taking action. So this is for people to discuss, give their opinions, but the board will not be taking a vote or make or making a decision because I know that sometimes that is not communicated correctly that and so when we say we're having a start and end times workshop people think we are taking a vote but this is for us to ask questions get information and especially with members who are not able to be here right now we would not want to take that kind of an action tonight so we are adjourning to our start and end times workshop and just also, although this won't be recorded, it is a public meeting, and those that are here in the audience or anybody else that comes up, they're welcome to attend and, uh, at, at part of this meeting. Is there a citizen's comments or a way for them to um, be a part of this workshop, during this workshop? No. No. So um, we will take about ten, five minutes or so. People need to get a drink. And then we will start at 8.40. Okay. We will start our uh, workshop at 840. I need to pull something like that. I have my computer on front of